Hi, this is Father Bill W. again here in Austin, Texas, and welcome to another podcast. Uh, I'm an Episcopal priest and uh, in long-term recovery uh, from alcoholism and any number of other things as well. So uh, when they say more will be revealed, uh, they're telling the truth there. Uh, These podcasts are uh, my attempt to kind of go deeper into the nature of addiction and try to explore some of the ways out some things that uh, got left behind either through the history or delving deeper into psychology, particularly the work of Carl Jung and uh, those kinds of things. So that's what I'm about. And uh, we have a workshop coming up this Sunday at uh, 10 o'clock. Uh, that's September the 12th, uh, Central, 10 o'clock Central. And I'll be presenting some very new material going to be looking at the 12 steps through the eyes of history. How did the pioneers uh, work their recovery program back in the days before there were actually steps, but there was a process that they worked that uh, that wound up becoming the steps. And I found that looking at those and experiencing those uh, can uh, make for a program that's a heck of a lot simpler and also I believe, much more exciting. Uh, Recovery does not have to be boring. I also encourage you uh, to visit our new website. It's called Two-Way Prayer. And there you can sign up for our newsletter. And that's another chance to go a little bit deeper into some of the subjects we cover here on these podcasts. And then uh, finally, I, I really want to express my thanks to those who've contributed financially to the support of this effort. Everything we offer here is free, uh, but we do have expenses and your donations help us uh, pay the bills. And and I want to thank those who have donated. And if you haven't and would like to, please uh, just go to the website and hit that donate button. I very much appreciate it. This series that we're doing now is based on the book, The War of the Gods in Addiction by David Shane. And uh, in the last two episodes, uh, we looked at the correspondence between Bill Wilson and Dr. C.G. Jung. Uh, In Bill's letter, he thanked Jung for his contribution to the development of Alcoholics Anonymous. And then Jung wrote a very quick response uh, where he laid out in some detail what his own theories and understandings were of alcoholism and addiction and specifically how important it was in his view that there be an underlying spiritual solution uh, to the recovery process. So now I want to pick up uh, with uh, chapter two of Shane's book, and it's titled The Psychodynamics of Addiction, the Development of a Typical Addiction Process. And here we have uh, what the author sees as five distinct stages in the development of a a true addiction. And I think it it can be helpful to look at each one of these stages, uh, learn what we can from them to get a better understanding psychologically and spiritually as to what's going on in in this illness. So stage one is uh, about the ego and its alignment Uh, with the false self. Shane begins by defining the ego. He says, psychologically, the ego is the central organ of our consciousness. It is the air traffic controller of what we see and think, feel, sense, intuit, and experience. It makes our choices and beliefs and decisions. It defends its existence and integrity against the threats to its power, control, and survival. We identify ourselves with our egos. The sense of I-ness derives from our ego complex system. So um, when we're born, uh, we don't really have an ego. Uh, We are enmeshed in... in, uh, in universality, in God, in uh, a very alternative state of consciousness. And we need, in order to function in this world, we need to develop uh, an ego to separate ourselves from our mothers, uh, 
Some of us don't do that till we're 49 or 50, you know, <laughs> but we have, we have to assert ourselves and learn to operate in the physical world. And you can't do that without an ego. So uh, it's a necessary thing, essential that we have one, uh, but it needs to develop properly. And if it develops in a healthy manner, it will serve us well. But if it develops in an unhealthy manner, Shane says, this is where we sow the psychological seeds of addiction. Um, so um, then, then after describing um, the ego, he goes on to look at the persona. And that is the image of ourselves that we show to the world. So I've got my ego, uh, my sense of self, and I've got my persona the mask that I'm going to put on and show to the world, this is who I am. And persona uh, derives from the Greek theater. You know, if you remember some pictures of that in high school, they'd be doing a play and uh, they, they didn't have a uh, big theater productions, uh, costuming and that kind of thing. So when they wanted to put on the character of someone else, they would put on a mask. And the audience knew from the mask that they were putting on that this is, uh, this is a change of character. <clears throat> so Shane describes it uh, as the face we wear to be presentable and acceptable to our society. It is not necessarily who we really are, but who we want and pretend to be to others and many times to ourselves. The great danger of an ego over identification with the persona is that we begin to believe that we are our well-constructed, overly idealized mask and not who or what we really are, warts and all. So we get lost in a sense. Uh, we are, if, if we overly attach to this persona, we lose track of our of our real genuine self uh, that w that we have problems. So someone said the, the most difficult uh, three words for an alcoholic or addict to say was I was wrong. Uh, no, we're go we're going to fight like hell to prove and show that we're right. You know, uh, and, and 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 so our sense of self is is very distorted. Um, somebody jokingly described alcoholics as people who go in to see a Western movie and then they, they come out walking funny. It's like we're going to take on the personality of the last person we, uh, we came in contact with. Um, the author writes, the problem in individuals who develop an addiction is usually not one of little or no persona, but too much, too thick, too heavy a persona. When the ego identifies with the persona, with the mask, and not with the true self, it is a self-deception where we believe in what is ultimately not the reality of who, in fact, we truly are. And this is where so many of us wind up getting lost. And, and that's a huge chunk of what recovery is about. It's not just not drinking and drugging. It's finding out who the heck we are. Because somewhere along the journey, we got lost. And we've got to go back and, uh, and find that person and develop that person. Uh, so many of us, uh, and myself included in this, uh, we were screwed up long before we ever took that first drink or drug. There was no real solid core sense of self. And uh, I'll tell a little story on myself that uh, <laughs> I've kind of first got in touch with this. I wasn't really aware. But uh, in kindergarten, uh, uh, each kid for a week was made king or queen of the kindergarten for that week. And they gave you a little crown to put on your head and a scepter to rule with. And I thought it was wonderful. And I guess every other kid thought it was wonderful too. But at the end of the week, come Friday, uh, they took away my crown. And I went ballistic. <laughs> oh, my God. My sense of who I, I, I finally found out who I am. I'm the king, you know. 
and now you're going to take this away from me. Somebody should have sent me to treatment right then when I was five, you know? So, so that's, that's stage one. Who do we identify with? You know, do we identify with the too much with the persona? Because that can become a setup for addiction. Stage two, uh, then, is the development of uh, what Jungians call the shadow. And here is where uh, all of the things about ourselves that don't quite fit into our own image of ourselves wind up, wind up getting dumped. As Shane puts it, our shadow is the, quote, hidden unconscious aspects of ourselves, both good and bad, which the ego has either repressed or never recognized. It is all of the incompatible thoughts, feelings, desires, fantasies, and actions that we have suppressed and repressed into the personal unconscious, along with our more primitive, undifferentiated impulses and instincts. There's a lot in the shadow. And this, this is what a great deal of the unconscious is made up of. Uh, and, 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 and so we have to be in relationship uh, to that shadow. Uh, otherwise, it's going to come at the damnedest times and, and sweep over us. Uh, it's unconscious. And, and all the unacceptable stuff about ourselves gets dumped there. And then we try to slam and lock the door. The author says, the more we identify with our persona, our mask, the more that gets crammed into the personal shadow. It becomes filled to the brim sometimes, to our embarrassment and shame. It begins to emit bad odors, overflow, and leak out to bother us and be noticed by others. So we try to tighten the lid, plug the leaks, reinforce the bolted doors. None of these strategies ultimately is effective, though. The shadow will have its say and its day, one way or another. Did you ever do something that was kind of out of character? And then, and then you say, oh, I'm sorry for what I did yesterday. I wasn't myself. I wasn't myself. I tried that once with a, uh, with a therapist. And he said, oh, yeah? Well, then who the hell were you? <laughs> Oh, I was myself, but I was a denied part of myself. I was, I was a shadow part, and I uh, had unintentionally dropped the mask, and it came out. Hey? Shane then points out that it takes a great deal of energy to keep the shadow locked in its dungeon. He writes the screams and moans and rattling chains from our psychic closets, attics, and basements get louder and louder harder and harder to ignore, avoid, or forget. The conscious ego is now caught between a rock and a hard place. It is over-identified with the persona, does not know what to do with this crude and crazy personal shadow stuff, has no acceptable place to put it, and seemingly has no alternatives in face of these completely opposite competing demands. It truly appears to be an irreconcilable, no-win situation with no way out. Um, to get an idea of the shadow, uh, think of Ebenezer Scrooge in The Christmas Carol. He's, what's he doing? He's, he's a cheap, bitter old man. And then the ghosts from the past are coming to visit him. Christmas's past, Christmas's future. That's all shadow, shadow stuff stuff that he wanted to keep down inside of him, but they come rattling their chains uh, in the night. They come in the night. <clears throat> Jung once said, you must go and meet the shadow or the shadow will come and meet you. And this, I think, is what we do in our fourth steps. Uh, that's really a, a, a form of shadow work, of owning the parts of myself that I want to deny, that I want to hide, uh, 
that I am vaguely conscious of, perhaps, uh, uh, and then that, that, that come flowing out. They come flowing out. They come flowing out in our dreams, and they can come flowing out in our active imaginations as well. Stage three, entry of the potentially addictive behavior. So here comes the alcohol, the drugs, the food, the sex, or whatever into this setup that, that uh, psychologically this, this is where I am. And, and they promise to provide an escape from the dungeon. And, and they do. They deliver temporarily. Uh, maybe we sense the danger. This is dangerous stuff. But we think we're going to be the exception to the rule. Uh, we enter into a relationship with the bottle or with the drug. It becomes our friend, our lover. We start making an early deal with the devil to go back to what Jung talked about in his letter to Bill Wilson. You know, nearly every single male member of my family battled with alcohol and half of the women. But I figured I was smart enough to prove that I'll be the exception. I did not need help when it started affecting me negatively. I just closed off deeper and deeper, went down further and further into the basement. Hey, eh? just needed to try harder uh, when it got out of hand. <clears throat> now, Shane asks, is escape from addiction possible at this point? And he points out that uh, um, at, at this stage, people may be able to quit or moderate. And the big book says exactly the same thing. A quote from the book, though there is no way of proving it, we believe that early in our drinking careers, most of us could have stopped drinking. But the difficulty is that few alcoholics have enough desire to stop while there is yet time. And, and who would really want to quit completely? We, we just want the problems to go away, you know, if it's still working for us to some degree. And, <clears throat> and this can go on developing for some time, working out this relationship with the addiction, uh, the, the substance. And it can, it, addiction can, can come on to us quickly or it can uh, grow slowly uh, and develop over time. Uh, stage four. And this he labels the creation of the addiction shadow complex. Complex is a stuck part. Part of me that's, that's uh, going on at the, at the unconscious level and causing problems in my life. All right? Like a mother complex or an Oedipus complex. Uh, um, that, so this is the addiction shadow complex. And so now the shadow slowly begins taking over the personality. It is, Shane says, looking for any way it can to express itself. And what it wants, above all, is to continue to come up out of hiding, to show itself. Uh, um, and we got to remember, you know, the, the shadow is uh, both negative things about myself and very positive things about myself. But they both wind up getting stuck down there in the basement. You know, how many alcoholics and addicts uh, do we look at and say, oh, that individual has so much potential, but, but, but we don't act. We don't bring that into our lives. Um, so, so there's good and bad, uh, I'm not crazy about those words, <laughs> but, but they're, they're, both of those things are existing inside of my uh, shadow world. And both of them need to be brought forth if, if recovery is going to happen. If, if it doesn't happen, they're going to swamp over me. Um, and, and so here, uh, this on the good part, uh, I guess, Shane talks about creativity. And I think this part's important. He writes, alcohol and drug become shortcuts to creativity, a quick ticket, a free ride to paradise for the artist. You know, think of all the rock stars uh, who wind up dead uh, from drugs and alcohol. Think of all the poets and authors who turn out, uh, when you really get to read their biographies, that alcoholism or drug addiction was really playing a key role uh, in the development of their, of their personalities. 
Uh, I know whenever one of those uh, stars uh, turn up dead on the newspaper, get the report or something, I just wait for two or three days. When, when's the drugs and the alcohol uh, going to come up? And, and invariably, it's there and 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 was hidden. Um, <clears throat> He then quotes an author who writes, all addictions are killers. The addiction ultimately wants everything burned and sacrificed on its altar alone. And now we come uh, to be like two separate personalities. Dr. Jekyll, sweet, kind, um, considerate. uh, But then when Mr. Hyde shows up, the shadow comes out uh, in us. We can be cruel, abusive, sometimes violent. Everything we work so hard to repress suddenly comes roaring out of us. And let me quote uh, the author here at some length. Um, I think he has a, a nice handle on this. He says, under the influence of the addictive behavior, the shadow comes out in ways that are often completely the opposite of the typical normal attitudes, behavior, and personality of the individual. Shy introverts dance on tables. Timid, gentle souls pick fights with motorcycle gangs. Morally righteous preachers consort with ladies of the evening, and conservative, cautious folks become high-stakes, high-risk gamblers. In these ways, The personal shadow reinforces, encourages, and becomes dependent upon the addictive behavior to express itself, to have any existence in the light outside of the closet, the attic, and the basement where it has been locked up and hidden for so long. Often the addictive behavior allows the personal shadow the only opportunities to live and to be The more cut off and unconscious we are of our personal shadows, the more vulnerable we are to having those shadows break out and be set free for a time by addictive behaviors. So, um, I mean, this is like an alliance that's going on at the unconscious level. And, and, uh, And it becomes my source of life. And it's not a real life. It's a phony life. But it's the only life I know. And and that's why I keep going back to it. uh, Because I haven't found something different. I haven't found something more powerful to take its place. And if we do not find something more powerful to take its place, the shadow will win out. You know? If If it's me against the addiction, always bet on the addiction. But if it's me... In relation to God, uh, God is going to be able to overcome that addiction. Uh, so everything has to do with that relationship. Stage five, the addiction shadow complex takes over the psyche. And this is what you, we, we would call full-blown addiction. Uh, Shane says, the addiction shadow complex now replaces the ruling ego, my normal ego, with its own ruler, a puppet pseudo-king who serves ultimately on the the desires, interests, and the agendas of the addiction, which cares nothing for any other values or needs of the person, the psyche, or the true self, or for anyone or anything else. This is the all-consuming nature of addiction. He continues, there is a permanent hijacking of the entire psychic system. The normal ego complex and all its functions are as if put under a powerful diabolical spell that suspends and paralyzes them, the whole kingdom and everything in it. The addiction then replaces the old system with an entire ruling ego system equipped to perceive, judge, and act in as skilled, adaptive, and self-serving a way as the originally functioning normal ego complex system. Of course, it is an imposter, a liar, a deceiver and charlatan. But now the addicted person, his true self and healthy ego are helpless and powerless to fight or even object 
to the new dictatorship established. And Schoen ends this section quoting a well-known Jungian analyst. Uh, her name is uh, Marion Woodman, who says, at the core, the heart of every addiction is an energy which ultimately wants the person's very life. Shane continues, her experience with addiction leads her to the conclusion that the addiction wants everything for itself. And if that means that the individual must be destroyed in the process, that is just the way it is. She believes then an addiction truly has a spirit of evil, or put another way, there is an evil spirit in every addiction. So this, I believe, is, is what Jung was referring to in his letter to Bill Wilson, where he speaks of uh, the alcoholism that's at work in people like Roland Hazard, cases where the addiction is so complete, uh, where it has taken over the personality so fully uh, that it's then only subject to change via a deep psychic or personality change, uh, what the book calls a conversion experience. Uh, this is the only thing powerful enough to bring about recovery in the real addict. And I think there's a, you know, there's many people who come into recovery uh, who are perhaps not, quote, real addicts, you know, uh, that they, they can just get by with a, a little help from their friends in the group or a little help from their sponsor. Uh, they don't need the deep change. Uh, those of us who are really in the grips of true addiction, the real addicts, as we call ourselves in the program, uh, we have a, a need for this change at, a ver at the very deep level of our psyches. And, and this is what, uh, this is what, Jung is talking about uh, when he speaks about spiritus contra spiritum in his letter to Wilson. It's the spirit of God coming into our, our hearts and minds to do battle with the spirit of addiction. Uh, and, and that this is indeed a genuine evil. Um, in, in, in the next episode, we're, we're going to go much deeper, or Shane is going to go much deeper into what is really present in this evil that's present in real addiction, what forms does it take, and what is it that's necessary to overcome it. And this is heavy stuff, and I know that, uh, but I think it's important stuff. And, uh, and uh, it's also important to know that there is hope, you know. Uh, uh, the, the picture can look very, very hopeless, and uh, by ourselves, I, I think it is. So um, I hope you'll come back uh, for the next episode. We, we will get a little deeper into this. And, and I do hope that some of this information has been helpful to you because I think it's really helpful to kind of get a map of these, uh, what's going on in our unconscious minds. And if I can get a picture of that, then it really helps me to know what's going on in my life at uh, levels that I, I, I don't understand too, too clearly. Uh, but I think this uh, depth psychology uh, stuff uh, really can help. Uh, so again, uh, uh, if, if you want information on the workshop that we have scheduled for Sunday, the 12th of September, I hope you'll write me. You, you can get in touch with me at twowayprayer at gmail.com, and I'll be happy to send you a flyer and uh, pass it on to other people. We uh, we want to get a good crowd at this one. I think it's some pretty good information. So thank you once again for listening. Uh, God bless and uh, keep coming back.